The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning into this webinar from the National Association of EMS Educators. Today, we have an awesome presentation lined up examining a topic that certainly applies to all of us during these trying times, and that's maintaining resiliency under uncertain circumstances. Today, we'll hear from Thomas Lenz and Jacqueline Coda of Curtin University as they walk us through some tactics for handling chronic stress, nav navigating social networks, and provide you with some effective tactics for maintaining a healthy perspective. During today's presentation, we encourage you to ask questions through the question submission box located in your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll have the opportunity at the end to discuss questions posed throughout the presentation. Attendees of today's webinar are also eligible for one hour of CAPSI approved CEU credit. You'll receive a follow-up email after today's presentation with full CEU instructions, contact information, and the full webinar recording. Thanks again for joining us for today's presentation. Tom and Jackie, I'm really looking forward to what you have to share with us today, and thank you so much for joining us. Great. Thanks, Nate. I appreciate uh, your introduction, and to all of you on the call, I sure appreciate you being here uh, with us, and um, I learned today that it's EMS week, so happy EMS week. Um, to everyone. my I guess I should explain um, my proximity, locate, uh, you know, physical location on campus is right embedded in the EMS folks, even though I'm not uh, within their program. So I, uh, I get to interact with all the cool people every day. I always say it's the best office space on campus. Uh, so um, today's webinar, just as far as introduction goes, uh, it's just a, a bit of a welcome from uh, Jackie and myself, uh, and then we're going to talk about resiliency and well-being uh, for uh, probably about 30 minutes or so, and then uh, Jackie will take over and talk about lifestyle medicine and self-care uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then um, and then we'll take questions after that. But I want to reiterate what Nate said. If you have questions during uh, the presentation. I'd be happy to entertain those and we can pause and and uh, go over anything that you'd like. And so Nate's just going to interrupt me if you have something or I'm going to pause if I remember to. Um, uh, but anyway, so uh, please submit questions um, if you have them. So uh, like Nate said, my name is Tom Lenz. I'm a professor in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies at Creighton. I'm the program director of the Integrative Health and Wellness Program. It's a Master's of Science program. We also have a bachelor's program that I get to direct to. It's called Healthy Lifestyle Management, and those all fall under an umbrella of the Center for Health Promotion and Well-Being at Creighton. My background, though, comes from uh, pharmacy uh, of all places, uh, but my work in pharmacy is on disease prevention. Uh, a few years ago, we implemented some new programming relative to disease prevention and health promotion. So I transitioned over to a new department um, to work with these studies or with these uh, programs. So Jackie is going to introduce herself now and then I'll take back over. Hi everybody. Thank you for joining joining us today. I'm Jacqueline Coda. I am a, a paramedic. Um, I am also a retired Air Force medic um, and just recently went through the lifestyle Masters of Lifestyle Medicine program here at Creighton. Um, and so that is it. I'm also the clinical and field coordinator for EMS education, and I, I am right down the hall from, from Dr. Lenz. So it, it is quite a great uh, work environment we have. So um, that's it. That's all I got. So let's jump right in to resiliency. You know, when you think about um, what's currently happening, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, Resiliency is one of these topics that continues to, to come up, even though maybe the words don't necessarily come up, but it's how do I manage all of this? How do I deal with it? How do I wake up every day, feel like I have a purpose and can continue to move forward? Uh, and uh, one of the words I would have to say that I've either read or heard or even you know said myself, uh, it's in the title of our presentation, is uncertainty. It's something that we hear all the time. And I and I, I feel like ironically, the more we hear the word uncertainty, the more uncertain we feel. Um, so, you know, I maybe I should change the language that I'm using in, in webinars and so forth. But but uncertainty, you know, leads to this inability to have um, to be able to manage difficult times. So resilience definition would be ability to bounce back during uh, times of difficulty. And certainly I think this qualifies um, of, a, of a pandemic, a worldwide 
situation where, you know, if there was anything that um, showed us our humanity is the same, it would be what country you live in or how much you make or what gender your political affiliation or if you like the Cubs or the Cardinals, you're all dealing with something that is similar to uh, your neighbor and that um, we have to change the way we live. Um, and it's an interesting time because we feel like perhaps we are in some sort of transition. A good word for that is being in liminal space. So uh, liminality or being in liminal space means that we're in some sort of transition. Um, we knew where we came from, but we're a little uncertain about where we're heading and we're kind of right in the middle. And, it, and a lot of people have a difficulty with liminality because um, it doesn't feel great. It doesn't feel like you have a great deal of control. That leads to, you know, uncertainty. It leads to anxiousness and and uh, can be even chronic stress. So having the ability to have some way to be resilient or to bounce back, I mean, even on a daily basis, um, being able to keep up with things is, is are good skill sets to have. And of course, that's our topic for today. So, so uh, Nate, if you want to throw up the first question here, um, question being, um, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, I have found myself to be, um, and uh, you may be, you know, select more than one of these, uh, perhaps if it, I mean, looking pedagogically, so don't, don't judge on your end. This is a terrible, terrible test question. So, uh, but, um, um, to try to give an answer there and and uh, see what you what you feel there how this is going so I'll give you a moment it looks like yeah as we're um, this is kind of cool I've never done this before so I'm seeing the numbers keep continue to roll in and um, yeah I think we can close it out Nate at this point so it looks like 52% um, of folks said all the above um, but more irritable, inability, or unable to fully concentrate or engage, more fatigue than usual, and then 22% none, none, none of the above. Um, certainly this isn't, thanks Nate, um, certainly this isn't a, an exhaustive list of uh, what would be, um, no surprise here, symptoms of experiencing stress, right? If you're in a pandemic situation where uh, your life has a bit of uncertainty and, and life is not as quote unquote normal as way we that you're going to experience symptoms similar to this and so this leads us into um, into stress as the next topic here on stress so both acute and chronic are what we're experiencing here I think the longer this plays out we're experiencing a bit of fatigue um, you know some people had had this notion that all right we'll be back to normal um, by Easter, that came and went. That caused a bit of stress and, and additional fatigue for folks. Others then were looking to Memorial Day. Okay, so Memorial Day is going to come and, and, and go here. And then, you know, 4th of July, and then just keep moving down the road. And when does it end is causing some stress, both on an acute level, uh, but on a chronic level, and probably perhaps in that scenario, more on a chronic level. Uh, but certainly acutely day to day, if you have financial insecurity, if you have health insecurities, you know, if you're, if you're sick from this or if you're uh, potentially at high risk of getting sick uh, or um, or any other, you know, food insecurities or, you know, trying to be a stay at home, um, uh, you know, homeschool teacher and do your job at the same time all comes with stress. But, you know, a lot of this, um, we can look to our basically you know our our american way of life to say this shouldn't surprise us i mean we are in this country very focused on moving forward at light speed to accomplish incredible tasks it has been our way uh, since the beginning of uh, this great country but it has come at a price there is um, a certain amount of chronic stress that comes with being an american and living a lifestyle that is based on achievement uh, and and the pandemic has caused us to slow that, uh, and so we can't do things that, as we uh, quote unquote normally uh, would like to do, and and that um, comes again with fatigue. Um, that I feel like a lot of people are 
uh, trying to manage at this point, both emotional, physical, um, perhaps even mental, uh, maybe even spiritual. You know, there, there are a lot of levels of fatigue I think people are, are experiencing at this time. So what does that mean? Can we cope with those and how, how are we coping? Are we looking to the outside world, you know, at something outside of ourselves to cope with this? Are we drawing uh, something from our inner world to be able to cope? Is it using a substance um, to try to manage this or using um, behaviors that may be more positive, like uh, more healthy eating habits or getting some exercise or, or making sure we're getting enough um, sleep and stress management techniques? So, you know, I, I've talked with several people on both sides of this. I've got um, a niece who is absolutely thriving in this pandemic environment. She loves working from home. Um, her, you know, physical health has improved tremendously. Um, and, and she loves all things about this pandemic. It fits her lifestyle. But then, of course, I've talked with other people who are absolutely struggling um, because they are more um, social and they, they need to be in the office to see people. Uh, and, and I just uh, started reading an article today about how important touch is for our physical and mental health. Uh, and so when we can't interact in a normal way, uh, as we did before, that causes, you know, causes us to have stress and we, we have difficult time coping and certainly aren't able to thrive. So we're all in a different place um, with this. So second question on here, Nate, if you want to throw that up, um, says, I've been finding new ways to communicate with my family and friends um, since the start of this pandemic. Again, you know, pedagogically, probably not the great, greatest question. Um, but it looks like a, a two thirds to one third so far um, that people are finding new ways um, to communicate. And, and so, Great. You know, this is kind of is something that you would expect to see, especially where we're relying on, um, you know, Zoom for, I mean, how many people didn't know about Zoom before this thing? Probably a lot. But now everybody knows about Zoom um, and ways to communicate that way. So this leads us to uh, this notion of being connected with others or being uh, this, this idea of connectedness and how important it is for resiliency. And people are experiencing that very acutely right now. And, and the ideas of, you know, the people that I love the most, I can't go to them. I can't physically touch them and, and, and spend time with them like I did before. Uh, or even being in the office, those things have, uh, have a downside to them for sure. I mean, everybody likes their own space, but, you know, um, but the people who we love, we need to be close to them also. There's some great work by Christakis and Fowler um, that uh, they have a book called Connected, and they look at how important the connections are between people, at least in, in able to, being able to understand what, how the connections work and what they mean. And we look at a group of people, the upper left is a random group of people who are in the same space, but they don't have any connection with each other. You look at the move to the upper right, that is where an example of how one person has a connection with one person who has a connection with one other person. And it's like a bucket brigade, right? It's just one to one to one. Each person has the same number of connections. It's just one to one. Um, you get to the next one and each person has two connections and then that person has two more connections. And so it branches out like a tree. And then uh, the lower right is uh, an example of a military uh, where you have 10 people um, in a group and all 10 people are connected with each other and then that 10 people are connected to 10 other groups like them and so forth. So this is how we can look at groups um, and how people are connected, but in reality this is actually how people look um, in a group where, you know, person in the lower left that uh, is A has um, one, two, three, four connections, but then you get person B that is up a little bit there. It's got one, two, three, four, um, five connections there. And, and D has um, more connections than that. And some people are on the inside of this network and some people are on the outside. It's hard to see letter C, it's buried right in the middle, but they're right in the middle of the network. And so this is more what our, social experience looks like and that we don't all have the same number of connections. Some of us like to be in the know, in the middle of that network. Some of us like to be on the outside of the network. And some of us have uh, connections that are connected to each other. 
Um, and interestingly, if we go back a slide, something like in the upper right hand corner, this is on a side note, on the upper right hand corner would be awesome if our healthcare system and our government sort of work like this, at least if we be believed in how it was rolled and through uh, where you had a one-to-one -one connection and things happen in a smooth bucket brigade uh, type style but um, in reality this is what our healthcare systems look like so it's probably better to say that our healthcare situation or experience is not necessarily a system but more of a network and it's it's very dynamic um, but the reason I bring this up and how it relates to uh, resiliency among you know many other things I love studying this idea of connectedness but relative to uh, this topic of resiliency, social networks have um, a couple of very um, important concepts related to them. The connections or the linkages is where the magic happens. That's really the important part is, is what happens when people are connected. And then secondly, there is a bit of um, transfer of something that happens within the connection. There is a contagion-like effect, if you will, that um, interestingly, things like attitudes, feelings, and behaviors transfer from one person to another, and then from that person to another person, um, and on down the line. If you ever heard the um, this uh, expression of six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon, you ever played that game, everybody tries to find how close they can get of separation to Kevin Bacon, the actor. Um, there's actually some research to support that. The initial research, in fact, took place um, in New York, but they used an individual in Nebraska, and they looked at how many connections a random individual in Nebraska uh, was connected to someone in New York City, and it was six. Uh, and so that started this discussion, and then it was replicated uh, on a large scale, multi um, multinational um, um, study, and it and in fact showed the same as that nearly everyone on the globe is connected by about six degrees of separation. This just is fascinating in and of itself and too much to talk about at this point. Um, but it gives, it does give you, I think, an appreciation of how the spread of COVID-19 has happened because we are, you know, very closely connected um, a group of, of humans on this planet. The interesting part about this though, rel relative at least to resiliency is that um, although we may have six degrees of separation with everyone, we actually have three degrees of influence. And what this means is, however I feel has an influence out to three degrees of my social network. So my friend's friend's friend is influenced by how happy I'm feeling today. That's extraordinary. Um, my friend's friend's friend has an influence on body weight based on my body weight. Um, uh, again, extraordinary. I feel like the, the, this data shows us how connected we are. So if, if I'm being happy and healthy, then I'm affecting someone three degrees separated from me, and I may not even know that person. I may walk by them in the, in the grocery store and not even know that I'm three degrees separated from them and that, that I'm affecting them in that way. I think this shows us that in, in this time of uncertainty, which you know, we'll get to maybe later that really you know, all, of, all of history has been a bit uncertain, but during times of uncertainty um, that our connection and reliance on each other is, is absolutely critical. And the people factor of, of, of it's not just me and what I can do in my own self to make myself feel better and be resilient, I'm, I'm really reliant on other people. So I think, you know, in some ways we're moving towards this notion of it's not survival of the fittest anymore, uh, but perhaps being survival with unity uh, with each other. Um, this, this leads to this other, this graph, and I like to show this graph uh, when, when you talk about this topic. Um, it was um, published Stephen Covey in 92. Um, and it's really about this circle of control versus the circle of concern. So during times like this, where, where we don't know what tomorrow's bringing, things seem to change every day, and certainly six months from now, we can't really make any plans because we're not sure what that's going to be. It feels like we don't have a great deal of control. And uh, that can make us uh, feel very vulnerable, uh, anxious, uh, and, and certainly lead to feelings of not being very resilient um, because what happens is when we don't feel like we have control, this circle of concern takes over. 
we realize that there's so much that's out of our control. And we spend a great deal of our time thinking about what we don't have control of. And there's some interesting, really interesting research uh, that shows that the majority of humans spend their time thinking about things that are either replaying what happened in the past or being uh, stressed and anxious and nervous about what is yet to come in the future. Upwards of even 90% of our thoughts on a daily basis are either on one end or the other. So we're only talking about 10%, maybe 20% of our mind is spent being in the present moment. This is a, an issue when you talk about resiliency because it's really hard to get a grasp uh, and have any type of good feeling about your life if you're not living in the in, in the present moment and, and thinking about the thing perhaps that you have do have some control over, but instead of dwelling on replaying these events from the past, I should have done this, I wish this would have happened, if everything would be better if type, type questions that we talk to ourselves about, or looking at, I'm so worried about you know X, Y, Z that's gonna happen this afternoon or tomorrow or next year. Um, but being in the in the moment, in the present moment, and thinking about, okay, I do have some control over perhaps at least, um, uh, you know, reflecting on what I'm grateful for um, at this moment, getting enough sleep um, tonight so I feel better tomorrow, or this relationship that I have with my family that I'm quarantined in this house with, um, of, of making that um, something better. There are some things that we do have control over. And when we are living in the present moment, we realize that perhaps we have a greater control and, and then even broadening that out and influence um, than what we initially realize. Um, and when we do that, that blue dot in the middle begins to grow and it pushes the red space to a, to a smaller area uh, within that circle. Um, but if we look at the opposite and all we're doing is thinking about um, this circle of concern, that red space begins to push in and consume what we do have control over and what we do have influence over. So um, I, I like this image because it, it, it does give a sense of we do have some control over some things and, and it does certainly have an effect on how we look at today and tomorrow. This isn't a question that um, necessarily we're going to put up because it's an open-ended question. It's, it's, I feel like rhetorical anyway, but it's a, request, a reflection question for you. And, and how do you feel after you finish um, watching the daily news? Um, uh, it's really, you know, I think this goes, goes for outside of pandemic time too, that the news doesn't necessarily give you the good feelings. I mean, something like NBC Nightly News tries to put a good story at the end to make us feel good as we're walking out the door, but man, they spend 28 minutes on, on stuff that is very tough to, to consume. Um, and, and so we have to then um, look at, this is our next topic here, a bit of perspective um, first, and then look at what we uh, perhaps are grateful for and then looking at uh, this idea of giving and generosity. And so um, uh, this kind of leads to this uh, this slide and every good presentation should have a slide of Mr. Rogers in it. Uh, but in this one, I like it because it says, you know, when I was a boy and I would be see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Um, and I think that's true for when we look at the news, you know, and watch the nightly news and man, everything is doom and gloom and drama. And, you know, the news loves to do that. It's their thing, right? To put out drama, the first one to, to, to uh, you know, put out a, some sort of news story about whatever. Um, and, and rarely it's things that make us feel good. It's most of the time, um, uh, you know, the, the hard stuff. But I love this because there are always someone, there's somebody in the back end always who's doing something good to make something better. There are helpers everywhere. We just have to look for it. So this is leading, you know, talking about this idea of resiliency. It's part of being resilient, teaching yourself to look for the things that are positive as opposed to look to the things that are negative. And there are always positive and there are always negatives. 
but if we tend to focus on one or another, it has a great deal of influence on how we feel on the inside, um, in our inner world, and, and then you know, consequently certainly affects our resiliency. So then um, looking at this from a, uh, I always like to do this with students, um, you know, because students, students get a little dramatic sometimes and, and giving them a little bit of perspective always helps um, also, but um, um, I always start with them with this uh, idea of galaxies and scientists believe that there are a hundred billion galaxies and that each galaxy, each one of these hundred billion galaxies has a hundred billion stars in it and each star has at least one planet uh, rotating around it. Um, and so we're talking about billions and billions of planets and stars and galaxies and you can't help but going out at nighttime and just looking up in the sky and hopefully feel this sense of awe that I am part of something you know that is that is massive. It's not it, you know the universe doesn't revolve around me and and my head. I am part of something much larger, and this is a transcending thought, right? Of being part of something that's larger. Uh, feeling this um, transcendence is. Um, very helpful for having resilience because you know what you don't have to have all the answers we don't have to solve all the problems we don't have to know all the knowledge and our American way of life our culture here teaches us otherwise that we need to um, but but we can't we can we can never and so hopefully there's a little perspective there of being part of something much larger takes some pressure off uh, and again leads to resilience I don't have to be this everything rock star that knows everything and does everything one of my so the, and the second point on here about the encyclopedia of life one of my favorite authors is Ilya de leo she's a franciscan sister uh, and scientist who teaches at villanova and she gives this example of um if we looked at um, the history of the universe from moment one Okay, so moment one could be described as the big bang or whatever the the event whatever you want to call it uh, up until now, um, you could look at that uh, as in a uh, series of encyclopedias that includes 20 books, 20 volumes of encyclopedia, or I'm sorry, not 20, 30 volumes of encyclopedias. And each volume has 450 pages, and each page represents 1 million years. So to give you some perspective in that um, scenario, the Earth didn't come into existence until volume 21 okay so one through 20 was something other than the earth being there so two-thirds of the way there right it wasn't until volume 30 so there's only 30 volumes volume 30 on page 390 that mammals started to appear and it isn't until you get to volume 30 page 450 so the last page and you go all the way down to the bottom of the page and you go to the last line and you get to the last line you go to the last two words of the last line read human beings this is where we are this is where we're coming into existence in this grand massiveness of the universe that has been here for billions of years 14.8 billion years we are just coming into existence and we're just starting to realize we're just starting to understand our own consciousness within this realm of what is the cosmos or the universe um, and so the reason i say this uh, as examples is it's really easy for us to get into a mindset where our world is becomes very small it shrinks into something very small kind of like that bullseye showed a couple slides ago uh, in that um, I, you know, all I do is think about what's not going right for me and it's just within my four walls and, and, you know, it's a doom and gloom, but if we pull ourselves back and we pull ourselves out of that and we realize that we are something part of something much greater than ourselves, uh, that gives us a lot of perspective and, and can lead to a, a greater sense of resiliency when we have times like this where we're unsure about what the future holds one of the great practices too um, related to uh, this idea of um, resiliency is to have uh, a bit of gratitude and generosity and and this is where we 
um, having some pre being present within the, the current moment, um, as I said, not thinking about the past or thinking about the future, but being present and, and appreciating what is happening in front of me now. And, and perhaps then looking at it as an opportunity um, as opposed to a burden. Uh, the, uh, regardless of what happens in our evolution through time, and we are always evolving into something new. Um, since volume one of that encyclopedia up till volume 30, it's a series, it's a life story of evolution, and we're part of that life story, and we're continuing to evolve forward. So uh, there's an opportunity always with that as we continue to go forward. And then reflecting on the gifts that we have, and the gifts um, are easy, you know, some of these gifts are easy to receive, right? I mean, like, where you, you know, um, you get a present from someone that's, you know, an obvious easy gift of the sun is shining and the, and the, you know, it's, it's warm and the weather is beautiful. Those are great, easy gifts to receive, but some gifts are hard to receive. Maybe I lost my job. Maybe I am food insecure. Uh, maybe my health is not, is not good. Those are gifts nonetheless, but they're hard to receive. And looking at these um, in a different mindset leads to a, a greater sense of resiliency. And then the last point on this certainly is um, giving. And it's easy to say, well, give, because give is giving to other people makes you feel good. Um, but there's something that is counterculture to that for us, because most of the time we as Americans feel like we need to take and have. I mean, toilet paper is a great example during this whole thing, right? Um, and, and uh, you know, many other examples, I guess, um, at the grocery store. But um, when we give, it's, it paradoxically makes us feel better, right? It's not just about getting ourselves, but it's about giving. So giving of the gifts and talents and whatever it is that you have um, is a great way uh, to uh, have, have, be a more resilient person and have a more resilient um, lifestyle. This notion of very quickly tinkering and transformation. So what a lot we talk about in our programs at Creighton are this idea of tinkering. So a lot of times I think about tinkering as somebody who is a watch or a clock maker, um, where they're making a little adjustment here and a little adjustment there to make that device run more smoothly. And we do this when we talk about lifestyle behaviors like, you know, maybe exercising more, eating more fruits and vegetables or getting enough sleep um, or um, you know, not consuming as much alcohol or, or not smoking or whatever these tinkering strategies are that improve our physical abilities um, are really good. And, and those help us to feel better, um, you know, certainly physically, but, you know, emotionally also, um, and maybe in other ways too, but there's a next level to that. And a lot of times we call that, and, and uh, Jackie's gonna talk about this in a minute, but lifestyle medicine, where we're using these lifestyle behaviors to um, treat or prevent um, diseases. But there's a next level to that if we allow it to be, and that's this, this idea of transformation, um, where we're not just doing exercise so that our heart rate um, is you know, managed or our blood pressure is better or our blood glucose is where it should be, um, for instance, um, or, or we lose weight or whatever, just for a physical um, outward um, sign. But there's another level to this if we allow it to be, and we can allow ourselves to be transformed by this tinkering activities into something new where we realize that um, that this is helping me become a person who um, I'm different than I was before. Um, perhaps if I start eating differently and I, and I feel better, or I start exercising and I feel better, I start sleeping the way I should and I feel better, um, those are helping me to, to transform into another person. But we have to be open and accepting uh, and reflective on what that's actually doing to us. Again, a very important a notion for resiliency. And that leads us to this last idea of wholeness. And I usually uh, describe um, this greatest sense of well-being um, by the word wholeness. And, um, you know, many times what I, what I like to talk to my students about um, and teach them about is this idea of meditation um, and reflection. It's certainly counterculture, again, to our American way of life, because, um, you know, when you sit there, and you're meditating and like it doesn't look like you're doing anything 
Um, and that's, that's not, uh, that doesn't jive with us in America. We have to be doing something in order to gain something or move forward um, to get a benefit. And this looks like you're doing nothing. And when in fact you are doing a great deal um, in those types of activities, it doesn't outward look like, uh, look like it. The idea is um, to, to get to this greatest sense of well-being or wholeness is to be still, okay? Um, it's, most Americans have a very difficult time with this about being still. Um, and, and that can lead to something even greater. And this is this notion of contemplation where we're, where we're experiencing a higher level of consciousness about ourselves, about the world around us. And we see our place in the world differently. And we understand our connections, not just with other people, but with the world in a different way. It's like look, going outside at nighttime, you're looking up at the stars and you feel like there's something in you that I'm part of all of this, something very grand. There are many entry points into that. Um, they can come from any type of tinkering um, lifestyle activities, um, but certainly this idea of meditating and reflecting and being still um, is, a, is a great pathway, a great conduit into higher levels of consciousness. So I usually don't like to put conclusions in my sections or in my talk, so I put evolving thoughts because you know, I'm not really sure where, you know, what, what we can conclude anyway, but balancing our inner and outer worlds is um, a really great place to start looking where, okay, so I'm, I'm feeling anxious because of this uncertainty. I'm going to my outer world to cope, right? I'm going to alcohol or I'm going to drugs or I'm going to bad behavior, um, uh, you know, violent behavior or whatever. Um, is this outer world I'm going to, um, uh, gambling or I'm going to pornography or you know uh, those those things were those behaviors we're seeing right now um, because people are trying to cope with something that inner innerly feels not so great um, but uh, having a balance between inner and outer worlds is where we um, need to get a to, to move towards so that we can have this greater sense of resiliency um, appreciating our interconnectedness um, with all things, especially other people, and appreciating that, but but nature as well too. It can be nature can be, as a lot of people like to say, intoxicating. Um, if you go out and um, consume yourself within a forest of trees, there is something um, that happens to you. Or by water, there's a great science um, that supports uh, this uh, notion, but and because there's some sort of connection. Um, a very real nature connection that you feel. Um, embracing your liminal spaces, um, and I think an argument can be made for that we are always and forever will be living with some degree of liminality um, and coming to terms with that that we don't have control um, over everything um, can be very liberating and very freeing. Paradoxically, it is such an interesting concept that we try to hold on to control uh, so tightly that once we start releasing control, then we actually feel like we are more in control. Um, it's a very interesting and hard to wrap your head around uh, concept, but but very true, I believe. Um, tinkering and, and allowing your tinkering to transform you, again, many entry points to that. And then certainly um, giving, um, giving of your time and of your talents and of your treasures and um, uh, and it doesn't have to be something dramatic where you're given a million dollars. It's just, you know, giving a smile, holding a door, you know, whatever, whatever that is, um, giving of yourself um, is really helpful for resiliency. And then lastly here, replacing your small world with a huge cosmos, right? That notion that the universe doesn't revolve around me and my four walls and woe is me, but that I am part of something much larger and, and this transcendence helps me definitely to cope. Once I realize that I'm not the center, then it's very freeing and liberating um, to be able to operate um, in, a, in a way that, um, that is, uh, has resilience to it. So I'm going to hand it over uh, with that to Jackie. Um, sorry, Jackie, I went a little bit long on that. She's going to talk about lifestyle medicine and self-care. Okay, um, no worries. I, I appreciate that you took a little bit longer than you had expected. So that means I don't have to talk so so much. Um, but just just to kind of go over you guys um, some lifestyle medicine like um, definition and then some self care. 
um, items and behaviors you can do to kind of get through some of these trying times. So what is lifestyle medicine? It is the use of like healthy lifestyle behaviors to treat, um, prevent and reverse illness. So over time we, you know, our nutrition goes bad or, you know, we become, you know, sedentary and we don't participate in exercise. And then we are stressed with our day-to-day -day lives and work. And before we know it, we have chronic illness. So um, that's what lifestyle medicine is. It's like, how can we make that better? So uh, what are some things you can do? Um, some activities that you can do for yourself um, and, you know, with your family to help you feel better and to have, you know, sleep better, eat better, things like that. So. Um, First of all, it's what I like to call my my three R's, rest, relax, and reflect. So are you getting enough rest? Are you taking some time out to um, have a consistent schedule to, to get to sleep and to wake up every day? Um, I know some of us are now working from home. And so what does that mean? I mean, are we, you know, are we sticking to a consistent schedule? And how does that affect our um, our work habits and our life, you know, how, how do we balance that? So um, get the rest you need, you know, it's okay. Turn off, um, you know, social media a couple hours before you go to sleep um, and, and get the rest you need because you're still working even though you're not going into the office. Um, relax, um, you know, deep breathing. Um, you know, Dr. Lenz touched on a few things. Um, you know, it, take time for yourself, read a book, journal. Um, get out to the garden. You know, if you have a yard, do some yard work. Um, most of my neighbors have have done quite a bit to their yards in the in the past couple of weeks, and um, they're doing things together. Um, and reflect, uh, reflect again. Um, meditate, pray, take five minutes, and sit in silence. Do some deep breathing practices, and um, as Dr. Lenz mentioned, touch on those gifts, um, and that kind of all contributes back to that wholeness he talked about. Um, and of course, exercise. Um, you know, I, I can talk so much about exercise. I, I I love it. I love the the fact that we can, you know, walk, jog, dance, do some yoga, and and move around um, to to get moving. And you know, after you spend 20 or 30 minutes walking. Um, you know, you feel so much better and those endorphins come out and, and you're in a better mood and you want to conquer the world at that point. And so you want to keep going and before you know it, you feel better and then it kind of spills over into, you know, your attitude at work and your attitude towards your family and your communication and, and whatnot. Um, I did touch on sleep already, but um, make sure you're getting those eight hours of sleep, you know, go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time and, you know, sticking to that consistent schedule will help you. Um, you know, feel, feel revived and, and, and the rest that you need um, for the next day and the next day and the next day. So um, also moving on, uh, take time for yourself and it's okay to be selfish. Um, take five minutes, take 10 minutes if you have it. Um, you know, I, I was just thinking, you know, what if you're, you have to go into the office and you're not quite ready to walk in the door? Well, sit in the car for five minutes before, you know, before you walk into to the chaos that that is awaiting you once you get home from work. Um, and, and what that does is that allows you to kind of breathe and close oh. your eyes for a, qu a quick second, you know. Um, but take time for yourself. Find it in, you know, take a bubble bath. Um, you know, if, if there's there's all these free classes online, I, I was looking the other day, Harvard is offering tons of classes for free. Um, and it tells you how many weeks you have to set aside to, to, to take these classes. Um, additionally, I know um, people are taking up drawing and painting and as you go into the stores, they're out of all these supplies because people are trying all these new things at home. Um, you know, Dr. Lenz mentioned tinkering, you know, try, try organizing or, you know, get out to your garage and, and organize it. The basement might have things that you need to donate and you know again giving back giving giving things to someone else that they can reuse or use um you know a lot of people are you know auto mechanics they can work on a car or a motorcycle um organize your important papers you know now is a perfect time to to get all your important papers in, in one location you know do those types of tinkering things to you know spend some time you know with with uh, your family or, you know, getting that lined up for them. 
I know that probably didn't make a whole lot of sense. Sorry, I lost my train of thought on that one. Um, and schedule some time personally, professionally, and, and with your family. Um, personal time again, you are able to um, get out to you know the gym or walk outside or run a trail. Do that for yourself um, professionally. You know, have those Zoom meetings with your staff. Um, spend some time talking about something other than uh, work. You know, get together on a Zoom and talk about what have you been doing. Um, I know for us um, at Crane EMS, we, you know, overnight we went to an online, online only content. And so what was happening is we weren't really seeing and, and kind of interacting with the students. So what I came up with is, um, was an idea called Motivational Monday. And I asked the students to send me a photo and by Friday, and then over the weekend, I would work on like a PowerPoint presentation. And on Monday, you know, I'd set it to music and, and it would show what, what the students were doing uh, on this time away from class. And they could see what their classmates were doing, who's cooking, who's running, who's, you know, who's working and those types of things. And I, and I think it helped. I think it kind of it brought a little bit of a, um, a calming effect to, to all the chaos that was going on with the class and kind of helped everybody see each other outside of the online content. Um, and then take that for your family. Um, you know, again, I outside I'm, I'm seeing families walk. I'm seeing more activity in the outdoors. And so, um, if you have a moment, if you have a day off, or if you have even 10 minutes to take a couple of laps around the block with your family, you know, put the kid in the stroller and and get going, and or the dog, bring the dog with you, kind of thing. Um, that might help you set aside some of that. That valuable time and help with communication. Um, some of you answered that you know you're not really communicating or you haven't had any issues with that, but maybe you know talking about something other than COVID or something other than work, um, maybe plans, you know, what are you gonna do after or if this ever kind of settles itself down, you know, what will you do as a family? What we do, um, what are some goals and things like that. You can talk amongst yourself about things like that. Um, and also try something new. Um, I touched on a few things, you know, some people are learning how to cook. Some people are, um, you know, learning a new language online. Um, some people are, you know, always wished about being writers. And so now they're, they're starting to, to journal more or write more um, to kind of help pass some of that time. So those are some just out of the, out of the box kind of items um, for self-care, you know, and, and it's all about you. It's okay. It's, it's okay to take time for yourself, like I mentioned. So um, that is pretty much there. Pretty much it. There's a, a plethora of, of items out there for self care, but whatever works for you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. We really appreciate both of you guys. Um, all that information that you were able to share with us. We did have some really awesome um, questions come in that I think would be great for you guys to speak to. Um, the first one being, it's a fairly robust question, but I'll try to summarize it all together. But I know, Tom, you sort of mentioned this at the end of your section. The connect, Could you speak to the connection between people and nature and your connection to nature providing you with the ability to manage chronic stress? And then on top of that, um, do you think that there's a possible connection between the the natural connection between people and nature and then you know, maybe the American lifestyle or science rejecting that connection, and now we're being forced to deal with our place in the world? Yeah, what a good question. Um, you know, I, I would first um, start by saying that, you know, if you look back at our history, at a time when the, when the United States uh, was, was born, if you will, was just when this notion of modernity or modernity, however you'd like to you know, say the word, was just becoming of age in Europe. It was this new way of thinking that all of our um, ideas of the world and how the world works can be controlled by us because we figured out um, this idea of science uh, and that we were, you know, this is where um, it started in, you know, the, the, the 1400s time period, uh, but certainly took took real hold during the Enlightenment time period of, of the history of the world that 
um, this notion of science can explain everything. And so therefore I have control over everything um, took hold. And so that really affected how we as Americans looked at life because you know, as as you you come to this new world that was uh, the United became the United States, and you had the gumption to go get it and and do what you know. If you had that cowboy mentality, that by golly, I'm going to go out and and do it. I'm going to tame the wild west. Um, that's how we still think, and that's a very um, if you would like to use the word reductionistic and how we. Um, solve our problems and and particularly relating back to our health and that everything can be resolved reductionistically with science and that okay if you've got um, uh, if you have diabetes and it's because you have you know high blood sugar and you have high blood sugar because you're insulin resistant and you're insulin resistant because uh, you have uh, you're overweight and not exercising so let's just back the train out you know go forward on that line of thinking and say well let's just exercise and eat better and maybe I'll we'll take a drug that helps you know with with that type of thing too and then it's going to make all the diabetes go away well you know that's true but that's not the full story that's it, it is how we like to think in medicine is very reductionistic and everything's explainable by biology. Um, now you insert yourself into this idea of nature can help with my emotional and mental and spiritual and physical health. That isn't necessarily well received in this whole idea of reductionism. Um, even though nature is biology also, there's a lot of, you know, what, what some people, you know, would call like a, a wishy-washy something going on there that I can't explain. And we love to explain everything. Um, it's how we feel like, uh, especially as educators, how we feel our existence uh, is by having the answers. Um, but this notion of being immersed in nature or being bathed by a forest um, has real merit to it in what it does um, to us as far as um, even physiologically, if you wanna go there looking at the, the pathophysiological cascade of the stress response, I feel like lines up directly with something like this where um, you, sh you see um, levels of, of cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine decreasing when you're put into a situation like that um, and and, and it, there's something um, there's something more to it that we don't particularly know and, and are having a hard time explaining our connectedness to it and um, you know if you really want to want to get into this um, read some things about how quantum physics and quantum mechanics um, plays out and it and it shows how the universe is really created um, from energy um, and that most everything that we interact with is really energy in itself and even if we can't see it and that may be some of the explanation with this notion of nature um, having an effect on us and our con connectivity or connectedness to it um, and it's a very long the the answer is very long sorry for the rambling part there's some excellent um, books about um, our connection to water our connection to um, nature and how that can help us feel more relaxed and and less anxious I um, mean we spend time outside um, you know I, th I think we know it intuitively when we go for a walk and spend that time outside um, but there's a there's a lot um, I think we can uncover from a science standpoint, but also from a non-science standpoint. Awesome, that was a fantastic answer. Thank you, Tom. Um, we also had one more question that sort of pertains to some to the exercise that Jackie described in your section, where you had um, you had people send in basically summaries of what you were doing, what they were doing over the weekend, and that helped people sort of check in and see what everyone else was up to, and it sort of felt like they were still connected with their classroom. We had a question basically asking, could you explain a little bit more about how you did that? Did you just have people send you things directly, and then you shared them with the class, or how was that arranged? Um, so I had this idea in that we we had uh, one of the the lectures that came out, and we were on Zoom and looking out at all the pictures of the students they were just 
they were unhappy. And so I sent out an email and I said, hey, I have this idea. Um, if you don't mind sharing, um, send me a photo of what you did, what made you happy this week, what made you excited, or what did you see that you took a picture of? What, what are you cooking? What are you doing? Send send me that photo. And so um, I asked him to send it to my email or my um, text it to me, and I would then gather all the photos. And I, I not everybody participated, and it, and it was not mandatory, but. Um, I would get the photos and then I I was going to just put them all on one sheet of paper and then send it out as like this collage type thing. And then it kind of morphed into this PowerPoint presentation set to music. And, and it was just meant to kind of, you know, motivate them to, you know, hey, look at you, we're all in this together kind of thing. And, um, and it's so far I was on, we're on week five. I think this was the last week because because now we're we're sort of back in back in the lab sessions now. So um, I, I I'd like to think they enjoyed it. I get a few emails that the kids like it, but um, they turn out pretty neat, and it just it makes me happy because um, they're doing great things out there. I got somebody that's been cooking. I got another girl that's been knitting. I've got um, a couple of guys are are working out in the field and and jobbing it, you know, and so. Um, it's kind of neat to see what everyone's doing in their personal life. So, and they're sharing it. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I think that pretty much sums up all of the questions that we have right now. If anybody has anything quick that you want to get in right at the end of the buzzer, we have a few more minutes. We're coming up on one hour. Um, but I do want to say real quick, thank you so much for everything that you guys have explained today. It's been really, really helpful. And I know that our audience, we've had some comments coming in saying, I know we have a lot of attendees, but it feels like you're talking right to me. So I know that we were giving them information that was definitely needed. Um, and I also want to say, if you, like I said at the beginning, you will receive a follow-up email with all of the information that we've talked about in the presentation, a full recording and instructions for how to receive your certificate. So that will all be sent directly to your email. Um, everything should be go out a few hours after this is over. Um, if you have any, do you want to wrap up? Do you have anything else to say, Tom or Jackie? Here we go. I guess the the last um, just as a, as a as a sign off. If you um, have questions or comments that you'd like to continue to to chat about, um, Nate has my contact information. I should have put it on the last slide here. Um, that he can you can you know I, could they email you, um, Nate or? Yeah, um, I guess I could. If you want, I'll include your email in the follow up email. So oh, yeah. with all the instructions okay. and everything, it'll be there. Perfect. That'd be great. Yep, absolutely. Um, it looks like we've got everything pretty much covered. So thank you guys again for being here. I really appreciated it. And thank you all, everyone who attended. Thank you all for taking the time out of your business schedules for this today's NEMZ webinar. Um, like I just said, you'll watch your email for the follow-up email, and it'll all have all the information that you guys need. So thank you, Tom and Jackie. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.